Welcome to the land exhibit here at the Natural History Museum of Utah. Here we explore Utah's diverse geologic past and learn about how the earth works. Here in Utah, we have an amazing geologic record that stretches back over a billion years. Um, a lot of that geologic record is represented by the sedimentary rock layers preserved on the Colorado Plateau in central and southern Utah. And we've got some of those rock layers on display here behind me. So at the base, we have the Kaibab Formation, which is about 275 million years old and represents a shallow ocean. Then we have a series of rocks from the Triassic period that represent rivers and streams and floodplain environments when the first dinosaurs were walking around in Utah. And then we transition to a desert environment with lots of sand dunes spread across the entire western U.S. And that's the Navajo sandstone that was many of these really beautiful red and orange rocks we see in southern Utah. And we've got a really special fossil from the Navajo sandstone that shows what sort of animals were living in this desert environment 180 million years ago. That's this animal here, this fossil, Saitad rusai, a very early plant-eating dinosaur. And it's a relative of the later plant-eating dinosaurs that have really long necks and were multi-ton beasts like Diplodocus brachiosaurus and their relatives. You can see some of the backbone, the ribs, part of the forelimb, the hand here, and the hind limb and the foot. This dinosaur, Saitad, is only found in Utah. In fact, this is the only skeleton that's been found anywhere in the world. And so this species is unique to Utah and unique to this desert environment. After the Navajo sandstone, we continue to have more of a desert environment. But as we get into the Cretaceous, there's um, a rise in sea levels and we start to get shallow ocean sediments deposited with all sorts of ocean animals living in, in them. And that continues till the Strait Cliffs Formation, where we have a retreat in the sea levels again, and now we have rivers and streams populated by dinosaurs. Finally, um, after the dinosaurs go extinct, there's a bit of a gap in where sediments are deposited, um, but then we have the Claron Formation, which represents streams, rivers, lakes from about 50 to 45 million years ago. So with all these different rock layers in Utah, we can see that Utah wasn't always a high desert plateau. Um, it's represented everything from tropical oceans to sand dunes to rivers and streams with dinosaurs walking about and shows how the earth has changed over the last 275 million years. In this part of the land gallery, we have some beautiful artistic reconstructions showing what Utah looked like over geologic time. For example, here right before the age of dinosaurs in the Permian and Carboniferous, we see how Utah was covered by these shallow oceans and seas. But as we get into the age of dinosaurs with the Triassic and Jurassic periods, sea levels lowered and things dried out, First we had rivers and streams, and then we had this vast desert of sand covering much of Utah. But going towards the end of the age of dinosaurs in the Cretaceous period, things started to change again, and we had rising sea levels with this big seaway that split North America in two. And we can see the western part of that sea with many marine creatures and other ocean-going animals that were swimming across much of Utah. After the age of dinosaurs, we get into the Eocene about 50 million years ago. And during this time, there was lots of uplift of mountains in Utah, but also these really big lake systems that covered much of Utah and Wyoming that were filled with freshwater animals. And this shows how Utah's environments have changed over geologic history and how those changes are represented in the rock layers we see today. I'm here at the Natural History Museum of Utah in the Land Gallery. Behind me is a model of the Earth. All of the lines represent plate boundaries, but Utah is not on a boundary. So why do we have earthquakes here in Utah? Earthquakes occur below the surface of the Earth between two solid blocks of rock that slip past each other. Where the earthquake occurs is called a fault. Here in Salt Lake, we are at the eastern edge of what is called the Basin and Range Province. 
This is an area of Western North America where the surface of the Earth has been extending over the last 17 million years. Earthquakes have a lot to do with forming the valley that we live in. Rocks that make up the Wasatch Mountains have been uplifted six to seven miles from below the Earth's surface over millions of years. Each earthquake uplifts the mountains and down drops the Salt Lake Valley. The uplifting happens during earthquakes on the Wasatch Fault or other local faults. The Wasatch Fault is the longest fault in Utah, but there are many other regional faults. Many of these faults west of the Wasatch Mountains are associated with the extending crust of the Basin Range Province. On the morning of March 18, 2020, the Salt Lake Valley in Utah experienced a magnitude 5.7 earthquake. The energy released was the shaking we all experienced. Earthquake energy radiated out in waves like a pebble being dropped into a pond. The magna earthquake was felt even here at the Natural History Museum of Utah. You can see the Lithornax bobbing its head as the earthquake waves move through the museum building. Hundreds of thousands of people felt the magna earthquake. When you visit the Natural History Museum of Utah, you can see how a seismometer detects the wave of energy released by your jump. Pretty cool. We live in earthquake country, so we have to figure out how to best live on shaky ground. When the earth shakes, buildings must be able to flex and move with the ground movement. When you visit the museum, you can build a structure on the shake table and test it against some of the largest earthquakes the earth has ever seen. Scientists cannot predict earthquakes. We use information from studying geology to understand where ancient earthquakes occurred, and we can use scientific devices called seismometers to measure very small and very big earthquakes and learn about earthquakes as they happen. So remember, if you feel shaking, drop, cover, and hold on. Or if you're in a wheelchair, lock, cover, and hold on. Welcome to our Life Gallery. Here, visitors can explore the vast diversity of our animals and plants that you can find here in Utah. We also have a beautiful collection of dioramas here at the Natural History Museum of Utah. That's one of my favorite things about this state. I can find so many different types of habitats or places animals and plants make their home. In order for animals and plants to survive in a habitat, they need adaptations. An adaptation is something about the way an animal looks or behaves that helps them get their survival needs. What are the survival needs of animals and plants? The same that they are for you. Living things need food, water, shelter, and a safe place to live. We're going to be exploring the dioramas and taking a closer look at survival needs, habitats, and adaptations. Our first stop is the Alpine Diorama. This habitat is found above 10,000 feet in elevation. You can see it's really rocky here. In fact, the harsh conditions make it hard for most plants to survive. Plants that grow here have special adaptations, like tough leaves, growing in groups or close to the ground, or even a little fuzzy to keep warm. These adaptations help special plants like alpine forget-me-nots or black and white sedge get their survival needs. If you're ever visiting a habitat or looking in your own backyard, you can use survival needs as a guide to help you spot all sorts of animals and plants. A great way to spot animal behavior is by looking at different shelters, such as rocks or fallen logs or trees or even marsh grasses or tall grasses. Looking at this diorama, I know that if an animal wants shelter, it should use rocks maybe instead of trees, which are a lot harder to find. Rocks are a great place for small animals like the pika to find shelter. Pika are small critters related to rabbits. They scamper on the boulders looking for little plants that they can eat or store for winter time. Pika need very little water, which is good news because water can be really challenging to find this high up. So they're adapted to get most of the water from the plants they eat. We can also look for places animals might search for food. If you're looking for herbivores or plant-eating animals, try looking someplace plants grow. Some animals use their specially adapted teeth to eat certain kinds of food, like this rabbit over here. They use their flat teeth to grind plants. Around your own home, you might see predator animals like hawks with curved beaks or cats with sharp teeth and claws. These parts or structures on these meat-eating animals function the same as knives or forks would function for us. Finally, we can look for places animals would want to raise their offspring. Remember, animals like baby birds can't do all the same things grown birds can do, like fly. So they need a safe place for a nest. Each bird builds a different kind of nest. They can be different shapes, different materials, or even tucked into unusual places. The Clark's Nutcracker makes its nest in outer branches of bristlecone pine. So we'd want to look in trees like that when bird watching. 
There's a lot of information to begin bird watching that will give you tips on habitats, nest, and behaviors to help you spot fun flyers. We're here at the Montane Diorama and we're going to do an activity. Grab a piece of paper and a pencil and pause this video if you need time to get these materials. Great. Now we're gonna use our eyes and observe what animals and plants we see in the montane habitat. The moment we get to the montane diorama, start writing down all the animals and plants you see. Do your best. You don't need to worry about spelling or getting the names perfect. Just write down as many as you see. After 20 seconds, draw a line and then keep writing. Then after another line after 20 seconds. We'll be doing this activity alongside you and I'll tell you every 20 seconds when to make a mark. Ready, set, go. Twenty seconds, make a mark. Now keep writing. That was another 20 seconds, make a mark. Last set, keep going. Finished. Great job, friends. What animals did you notice first? Did you notice any plants? Did you wish you had more time? There's no end to the species we can observe when we look more closely. You can observe big critters like elk pretty easily, but the longer you look, you may have observed things like the Stellar's Jay up in the tree or the Western Garter Snake in the grass. A habitat is not just animals. It's also plants and things like fungi. Did you notice these King Bellini mushrooms? They have a really important role in the habitat and cool adaptations. My friend is gonna tell us all about it. Hi there. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the more hidden things in our Montane exhibit here at the Natural History Museum of Utah. So specifically, I wanna to talk to you about a very special mushroom called the King Belit. So the King Belit usually refers to the species Belitus edulis here in the US, but it, it's known by many different names. Um, one of the most common names is the porcini mushroom. The porcini mushroom is a prized edible, you know, people eat all over the world. There are over 30 different species of Belitus edulis, but so far we've only documented two here in Utah. I'm a mycologist, or a scientist who studies mushrooms, and I'm studying these porcini mushrooms to understand and figure out how many there are, how they're related to each other, how they came to be, and how they're adapted to their host plants in their environment. So the mushroom that you see behind me, you know, you can see it down there in the soil, on the trees, here and here. This is actually the reproductive structure of the fungus. It's kind of like the apple of the tree. And these kind of show up, they appear whenever conditions are right, usually after it rains in the summer and early fall. The mushroom produces seeds called spores underneath the cap in these little structures here. It can make billions of spores at a time. These spores are so small that they float away in the wind and can even be dispersed by animals. Each spore will land in the soil and germinate like a seed, growing out in little tendrils called hypha. After germination, they can live for decades in the soil. So fungi actually make up a huge portion of the life in our soils. Um, it's part of the reason why I'm specifically interested in them. To give you an example of how many species there are, this is the family tree of the porcini mushroom. It's taller than I am. There's over a thousand species in this one group. Another interesting thing about the porcini mushroom is that it's a really special type of fungi called an ectomycorrhizal fungi. Ecto means outside and mycor means fungus and the rhizy part of it means roots. So specifically what they do is they grow in the soil. They build hyphae that kind of moves around into the soil column. They grow around the roots of trees and they pick up nutrients and water from the environment and they provide it to their hosts, the trees. In exchange, you know, trees 
do photosynthesis. They make energy. This energy goes to the mushroom in exchange for these nutrients. So hyphae are actually much better at getting nutrients and water from the soil than most plant roots, and they're able to grow much farther than most root systems. This makes them really good helpers at collecting nutrients from the soil and providing it to the trees. This can be especially useful to plants during limited water availability, such as the droughts we get here in Utah. And what's interesting is that both the plants and the fungus are dependent on each other. Neither would survive without this relationship. So here in Utah, all pine family plants do this, which means that the vast majority of our montane forests are actually entirely dependent on these mushrooms for their existence. In fact, all temperate forests worldwide are dominated by this relationship. Plants and fungi depend on each other for survival. We can guess that there's about 20,000 species of fungi that are ectomycorrhizal in the world, but we really don't understand how many there are. We know that many of them exist in Utah, but we've only really documented a few. They're a really important part of our forests, but unfortunately, they're understudied. So what we do here at the Natural History Museum is we document and catalog these species in order to understand how many there are and how they came to be. The montane habitat is typically what people think of when they think of forests. And while alpine and montane are unique habitats, most of Utah is actually desert habitats. But deserts are not all the same. In Utah, we have hot deserts and cold deserts. The thing about deserts is that they can be hot and dry, but they can also be cold and dry. We typically find hot deserts in the southwest parts of Utah, and the cold deserts are near the Great Basin. Even though these deserts have very different temperatures, animals have similar problems across these habitats, like no water. Look, let's compare some plants. Here in the hot desert, we have the Choya cactus. It copes with the shortage of water by storing it in its fleshy parts. It's also adapted with spikes to keep animals from munching and taking water from the cactus. The cold desert is also very dry, but here we find plants like the desert paintbrush that send roots deep into the ground that latch onto other roots and take water from their neighbors. You've had a chance to see some of the habitats we can find around the state of Utah, but also there are habitats around where you live. You can look in your backyard for animals and plants by observing closely and learning more about the habitats around you. There's so much more to see and learn in the Life Gallery, and we hope that you can visit us soon.